Hello, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Brilliant. Um, good afternoon. I hope everyone is well. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to join us here today, and thanks to our panelists as well. Uh, this is Voices of Sustainability, uh, a virtual fire chat series. My name is Jim Stenman. I'm a journalist. I've been based here in the UAE for the past eight years. Uh, worked for platforms that you're familiar with, CNN, Reuters, um, and so on. Uh, today, we're here to discuss the Zayed Sustainability Prize, which was established here in the UAE in 2008. And it's really a pioneering uh, prize that recognizes organizations and high schools that are involved in sustainable humanitarian solutions. Uh, and, and over the past 15 years, they've touched roughly 378 million people, either directly or indirectly uh, around the world. So huge impact and covering areas such as health, food, energy, water, and education, of course. So in today's session, uh, we have a unique opportunity to get to know the winners of this year's Zayed Sustainability Prize uh, a little bit more. And they cover areas such as health, food, energy, and water specifically. Uh, part of our panel today is Dr. Ricardo Alfonso Ferreira. I hope I got the pronunciation right. Brilliant. So you're the winner of the health category. And then we have Jean Ruppe, who's uh, the winner of the food category, from my understanding. All right. Excellent. And finally, we also have engineer Heba Assad, who won energy. And, uh, and then also Mahon Kumar Modal, who won the water uh, prize this year. So very excited to have all of you uh, with us here today. And we're looking forward to getting insights about your entrepreneurial journey and how you've gone about innovating uh, you know, for the past couple of years and talk us through some of the steps that have led to the moment uh, where, you, where you actually won this award. Uh, the title of this panel is Scaling Up Approaches That Work. And I think that's something that we really want to deliver on today to get some real insights into how do you take the idea into uh, a solution that essentially works. So all of you come from successful startups uh, or nonprofit organizations that have had this opportunity to turn innovative ideas into real life solutions. But obviously doing this is... Uh, it's not easy, it's challenging. Anyone who's run a business knows that uh, it's probably one of the most challenging things you can do. Uh, and that's what we want to explore today. So I'd like to start with you, Hiba, actually. So your company delivers electricity to communities that don't have energy access. How do you manage to pull that off in a refugee camp, specifically? So uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, just to uh, look our deeper, uh, closer to your questions, how we can make like a successful project. Uh, one of the key elements for making any successful project is to keep uh, or, or finding the key stakeholder for your project to understand their requirements, needs, uh, how the uh, expectation from this project. Once we have defining this uh, key stakeholder, we can collecting their needs requirement. Uh, then, uh, as we are working on uh, um, innovative project with a humanitarian context, we need uh, working on agile approach uh, because uh, it's the things become uh, changing rapidly, rapidly, and uh, we don't have like a clear visions at the beginning for this project. So let me have like uh, a deep looker in our project exactly. For example, let's start with the beneficiaries, one of the key stakeholders for our project. Uh, we have been done like uh, right survey, uh, focus group discussions with them to understand what exactly their needs are requirement, what is their expectations from this project, and how they can uh, see uh, the, uh, the outcome from uh, that project, uh, as well as understanding the old uh, experience for all the projects that already have been implemented in the camps and why it's failed or what is the successful or a pride story from uh, this uh, context. Based on that, we have uh, come up with a solution fit them. Uh, any, we, we have been uh, like uh, have uh, or distinct, distinguish uh, than other companies on the market. We don't bring like out of shelf product and then uh, customize them based on their solutions. 
Uh, then one, uh, let's me talking about another uh, key stakeholders. Uh, it's like the NGOs, uh, the private, uh, the the, the non-profit organization that we are working on with. Uh, they are managing the camps, so uh, we collecting a data. What's their need from this data? What's how they can apply or benefit from this data in operating the camps uh, and improving the life, the quality life for the people who are living there. Once uh, they underst understand their, their uh, perspectives or what they are looking for, we have developed like a platform customized on their needs. Uh, and one, uh, let me mention another one of key stakeholders in our, as well as in our project, is the governments. You need to understand the context that you are working on, especially in the area that we have like uh, many regulations needing to take uh, many permits uh, to launch these uh, solutions. Uh, for example, let me mention one of the challenges that have been mentioned, that we can uh, bring high-tech solutions like a LoRa network for the communication between the smart controller and the platform. This is like a, a high-tech technology, but it's something not applicable or cannot be implemented in the camps due to the permits that will be taking more than two years to get this such permitting. So yes, we can go back to uh, older technology and use it. Uh, so uh, it, it's, 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 it's useful or can be done uh, the objective for using this, this technology. And later on, we can like uh, scale or use this, the other technology can be fit uh, the need a requirement. Just uh, so to warm up what already have been said, we, we need to be like uh, using an agile approach, uh, using implementing the project in the iterations ways. So the first time uh, getting uh, the feedback uh, for the first version, uh, then and improved what already have been done. Uh, 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 seeing how this uh, project is go on to through. Uh, one or two years, uh, it is something can be benefit uh, for the project success. Excellent. And, and can you just explain to us how how do you bring the electricity to the camp in, in layman's term for people that don't understand? Uh, actually, we don't bring uh, uh, electricity. There is like uh, in the camps, uh, there is like uh, NGOs uh, responsible for implementing renewable energy systems there. And already there is on grid uh, systems if in the camps. Uh, uh, use uh, and th they are managing this electricity, but unfortunately, the main issue in the camps is the electricity absence, which reach more than 13 hours per day. This is due to uh, the funding agency agencies; they don't have uh, the the, f the funds that will uh, to uh, to provide the electricity 24 hours per day. So we have developed uh, innovative uh, solutions to ensure. Uh, fair electrical distribution for the exiting electricity already in the camps to uh, bit among the refugees themselves and extend the, electri uh, the electricity for the essentials need such as lighting, refrigerator, uh, medical devices uh, for uh, 24 hours per a day. This is the main idea for our project. Yeah, and it must be really inspiring to see the impact because it's life changing for some of these people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have like making a monitoring exercise before implementing the project and after implementing the project, uh, seeing the feedback from the beneficiaries themselves. Uh, this is done by third party, by NGOs, and uh, we have been uh, very happy to see this uh, results and how uh, implementing such a solutions and improving the quality of life of the people, how they are happy, how, how many uh, emotional stories that we have been uh, in touch with them uh, to improve their, their, their quality of life. In energy, it's like an essential need for anyone. So anyone should have an access for the electricity, especially for the essential needs. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Mahon. So LIDARS is a water resource management uh, model that solves water scarcity in disaster prone areas. And I know you've had a lot of success with this in, in, in Bangladesh specifically. So can you talk to me about the idea and, and how you went about implementing it? Uh, thank you, dear moderator and uh, dear panelist and, uh, and uh, audience. Greetings from Leaders. Leaders is a basically uh, grassroots level NGO working in the coastal area of Bangladesh. Uh, especially the uh, due to the climate sense, there have a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, crisis faces in uh, face the people in Bangladesh, and uh, especially especially the coastal area we face frequent disasters, salinity, and uh, also the uh, irregular rainfall. That's that's why the people are could not uh, cultivate the paddy. Uh, could not uh, cultivate um, uh, and, uh, and they could not cultivate the shrimp also because the salinity is so high increasing 
and um, the crisis started in 19 uh, 19 decades of the last centuries and uh, that time i was a, a student very young student and and that time the people the especially the marginal people and the landless people they are migrating from that area because that area is um, uh, basically a sundarbon area and the a landlord before um, 300 400 years ago they cut the forest and they make the settlement that that area it's a huge area uh, near 300 400 square kilometers so uh, especially that is um, very poor area and the landless people are living there very much and when the uh, crisis started uh, people are migrating from the from that area to other other areas and some of our um, friends and my um, relatives they migrated that time my maternal uncle also left that country because of the livelihood scarcity it is very painful that the people are migrating from their forefathers land it, it's hurt us and uh, we formed uh, a, a small club in 1996 when i was an, uh, a student and we really uh, organized some uh, cultural events some um, social events in the community after my completion uh, after completion of my graduation in uh, 2002 we started a small project in the community level in the sundarbon area and uh, we distributed some rain water harvesting system in the community and the community appreciated us so much and because uh, they can manage rice they can manage vegetables but without water nobody can live there so they praised us and uh, they uh, inspired us and that's that time we tried to uh, manage some funds from the individual donors from uh, some of our uh, relatives who are living abroad uh, they donated us uh, money and also some uh, some of our some small donors in bangladesh and some uh, some other countries we managed them to give give us a small um, small funds basically we tried to integrate it, uh, a lot of technologies we tried to make available a lot of technologies in the community to source the community because community people have uh, sovereignty to source some things because uh, we always NGOs are trying to uh, deploy some technology in the community. It may be not culturally accepted. It may be not user friendly. So our technology, our model is to make available all kind of technologies, low cost, high cost, medium cost user friendly then people have choice and if they if the some community choice some technology we provide them that uh, financial and uh, technical solution that is our main model thank you very much and and how is that system based by people living in this community on a day-to-day -day basis can, can you explain that for us uh, basically we are in the in the coastal area two type of water problems one is underground water is saline and people have to relate to the surface water but due to the um, due to the cyclones and tidal surge the surface water is contaminating with the saline water and uh, in some area the surface water is contaminating because of the uh, water logged uh, there have some area that the round the air that was water logged and uh, it is contaminated with the pollutions so we uh, installed different type of technologies to um, to treatment of the surface water, like the pond sand filter. Pond sand filter is a community-based solo sand filter filtration system in, in our area. We install um, near about uh, 20 villages, uh, 20 pond sand filter. In, and each pond sand filter, uh, 200 family can get uh, drinking water for each, um, uh, each technology. And we also simultaneously install some areas to bio sand filter. Bio sand filter also a um, solution technology but uh, it is a uh, household -based, tech based technology and till now we installed 5250 biosan filter in the community and also the coast the um, severe coast area like the severe saline area we installed rainwater harvesting systems and also you install uh, uh, reverse osmosis system to desalination the the sea water for drink and we also uh, managing the managed aquifer research technology. It's uh, another kind of technology that can uh, that can uh, reduce the groundwater salinity by injecting the sweet water artificially. That uh, five type of technology we installed in, the, in this area. And by our initiative, more than six 
thousand, sixteen thousand people uh, are have access to the um, uh, drinking water. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Jean, and hear a little bit more about your company, Insects, which is actually uh, leading when it comes to the development of insects-based proteins and, and fertilizers, natural fertilizers, that is. How were you able to scale your operations so quickly since establishing the company about uh, a decade ago? It took uh, 10 to 12 years to get where we are, so it's not like magic. It, it doesn't appear without a lot of uh, effort and a lot of work from, from our people. So the company uh, was founded by four people in 2011 with uh, one vision, uh, which is that uh, population is, is growing. Uh, today we are 8 billion. In 2050, we will be uh, 10 billion people. So the food requirements will also increase uh, uh, by 70 percent, according to uh, United Nations, between 2010 and 2050. So there is a need for producing a lot more, and at the same time, uh, the resources are being more and more constrained. So we have to, I mean, as, as, a, as a global community, we have to find solutions to basically do more with less. That's what it means. So that was the vision of the, the founders in, in 2011. They created the company, and uh, in the early years of the company, they focused quite a lot on, uh, on research and development. Obviously, when you are the first one, you, you need to invent everything. Uh, and it was mostly uh, uh, focused on research and development, uh, developing the technology to prepare for industrialization of insect uh, rearing. Uh, but also focusing on biology, understanding the insect better, uh, trying to optimize uh, the amount of resource that the insect needs to produce uh, one kilogram of protein. So a lot of work has been done on that. Today we can say that uh, insects are more efficient than the traditional ways to produce protein on just about all fronts. Uh, you need less water, uh, less uh, feed, animal feed. So the insect and less land. So it's all good for, for, for the environment. So the company really just started to invest big money in production capabilities um, four or five years ago. First, uh, building prototype projects, uh, and then more recently, uh, a, a large vertical farm in, uh, in Amiens in, in France. So now the big story is, is, is coming because uh, we invested a lot of money. We are able to produce a lot of uh, protein. We need to basically uh, tell the world that we are part of the solution uh, in, in the long term. And that's why this price is very useful for us because it gives uh, visibility and, and credibility. So that's what we need to do now to scale the operation up. And that's just the beginning of the story. And one conviction that we have is that uh, insect is part of the solution. It's not the only solution. It's like in energy, you know. It is not about wind or solar or one technology in particular. I mean, there is plenty of room for multiple technologies contributing to the food challenge that we are facing today. And how are people responding to uh, the idea of using insects specifically? Because I'm assuming that it's not widespread in, in the industry. And you're taking it back to basics in, in a way. Yeah, I think uh, there are countries where it's a no-brainer. I mean, certain, some countries uh, have uh, had insect in their diet for centuries. So today, if you ask them to eat insects, doing that on my parents and my grandparents, so it's a, no, it's a non-issue in, in, certain, in certain countries. Uh, in others, okay, the acceptability is, uh, is uh, a little bit more complicated, but I think there is a new generation that really wants to make change. Uh, we can see that uh, on all fronts, whether it's energy or water or, 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 or food, um, there is a strong pressure from the people to make sure that whatever we do or eat is more respectful for, for the environment. Is, uh, is bringing that. So it's, it's appealing for a uh, new, new generation which is demanding action. 
Uh, it's also, uh, I mean, helping the fact that uh, insects are good for health. It's not just a good solution from environmental point of view. Uh, it's also a good solution from a health point of view. Uh, there have been a lot of studies, and we have done some of those studies, showing that uh, protein, insect proteins, allow to reduce cholesterol, for example, uh, better digestibility uh, because of very low content, ash content. In, in the protein powder that we, we produce. And uh, last but not least, it has the right protein, because protein is, is a vast word, right? And there are different kinds of amino acids in, in proteins, and insect proteins have that characteristic of having all the essential proteins for, for, for humans. It means that, in theory, we could just use insect and nothing else, and we would be in perfect shape. And just quickly, what, what, what's the biggest impact you've seen so far in terms of using this, uh, this system? Well, on a global scale, uh, our production, if you compare our production with the food uh, produced worldwide, I mean, it's still a long way, right? <laughs> but I think uh, now the, the, the impact is, is what, uh, what we discovered, in fact, the result of our research. So the benefit of the technology on uh, sustainability questions and on, on health. Now we need to communicate that so that people understand the real merit of, of the technology and it will help uh, acceptability and basically making the difference uh, in the future in terms of quantities that we can produce and deliver to the market. Absolutely, extremely useful because we know that you know, the world population is growing at a, at a rapid speed and it is becoming increasingly more difficult to, to feed everyone. Um, I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Uh, Ricardo. Uh, your organization, uh, I understand, delivers quality health care to some very remote indigenous communities in the Amazon. This sounds incredibly exciting. Um, how, how were you able to navigate sort of the complex relationships within those communities while still coming in from the outside and developing a, a business model that works for you? First, you have to really listen to people, listen to what they say, the way they live, try to study a little bit. And before we go, well, when we go the first time, always talk to the leadership and speak with them and ask their permission to go and always know that you are a visitor. You are someone from outside, so you have to get their permission to go there. And uh, at the beginning, it was very hard because they would tell you, oh, we've heard of white people before, and you just come here and you talk a lot and you do nothing. But then, little by little, first time we went with we just four of us with 100 kilos of equipment and then we grew last expedition the 50th we've been doing this for 20 years it was over 20 tons of equipment that we brought in so you get you have to get the trust from these people and whatever you tell them do it don't promise anything you won't be able to deliver and remember always that you are a visitor you are there, and it's an opportunity to be there. You are not God or anything like that. Even though some of the surgeries we do, especially, you know, we work a lot with cataracts. Cataract in the Amazon forest, they are young, and they get blind very soon. On their 50s, on their 60s, they already can't see. So some people think, you know, it's a magic because... You get them, they can see. The next day in the morning, they can see. It's beautiful. Still today, 20 years later, 10,000 surgeries after, um, I still wake up in the morning to see them taking out the bandages and being able to see again. And we have to take a lot of care because in, in our expedition, there is two between 200 people that will come in and out of our camp. And sometimes some of them are enemies. So we work a lot with anthropologists so that it will tell us and we'll know who is the enemy of who. So they'll never be there at the same time. 
we want to come in, do whatever we have to do, and go out with as much as possible not interfering with their way of life. Well, I don't, I don't want doctors, I don't want nurses to uh, socially interact with the local population. We have to be in and out and have the less impact as possible. And providing this type of service, whether it's, you know, helping with, with cataracts or other medical services. Hernias and pterygiums, yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's life-changing, like some of the other um, innovations and solutions that we've discussed. What impact is this having on, on the community? Does it mean that they're able to, um, you know, sustain their, themselves to a larger degree, that they're independent? Because I assume that traditionally, if, if, you're, if you're suffering from a medical condition and you're not given quality health care within a specific time frame, then um, your, your, your health is going to get much worse and very quickly. Yeah, for sure. You, 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 I think every one of you can imagine what it is to live in a forest without being able to see or without being able to carry weight. It's very hard. and. And so, you know, this will change because they'll go back to their work, they'll go back to their own lives, and it's quick. It's kind of surgery that we do. It's they stay with us for, they come, we see them, we operate, and the other day they're gone. And they're good, which is very nice. So they can adapt themselves to their society, to their community again, very quickly trying, as I said before, to interfere the least, the better. And is that difficult sometimes? Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes, you know, they don't trust. They are always saying, oh, I've heard you white people before. You come with this talk. And so, but when, you know, after 20 years, I've been doing this for 20 years, so they already know us. They, 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 most of them do really trust us, I could say. Excellent. And uh, receiving this price money is going to allow you to scale what you're already doing. So what's the plan going forward? You know, I think just being part of here of this community, of this meeting that I'm seeing here, it's the price, the the. Zayat Sustainability Prize is important, but not as important as in the network that we're developing here. You know, getting all together with these people is another different ball game, isn't it? So I'm learning a lot to how we're going to scale this, but for sure we're going to be able to scale it up and do more, do more expeditions. And we have different projects today than at the beginning. At the beginning was just doing surgery. And now we have a women program so that we, we take out lesions, uh, uh, uterus lesions that are not cancer yet. And then we have a program of telemedicine that we're developing right now that we're sending nurses all over the Amazon forest for them to and we have specialized doctors in Sao Paulo in the, in the region of the Southeast where we have lots of doctors. So we'll be able to scale this up, I think, in a kind of a quick way because we've been doing this for so many years, but now we are ready to grow. And I think this money and this network will really help us, you know, talking to people about water, you know, listening to water projects, energy projects, that will help us a lot. Excellent. Uh, I'd like to extend the same question, actually, to, to you, Jean, and then go around the circle. What, what does this price do for your operation, scaling up? You talked about a, a, a vertical farm and, and doing what you're already doing, but at a much greater scale. So what happens after this, this win and this price? Yeah, um, basically, I agree with what Picardo mentioned. And for a startup, the money is, is always an issue, right? I mean, for all our activities, I guess it's always an issue. So I would say for us, uh, 
the best use of that money would be to work on specific research program to kind of, uh, I mean, continue progressing the, the, the technology. Uh, and also, uh, I would say the, the, the big merit of this, this uh, prize is, is giving us visibility uh, and credibility. Uh, adapt um, acceptability is, is clearly one of the key drivers for, for the future of our insect business. So uh, events like this, uh, because of their, I mean, their reputation, uh, and, and, and Zayed Price with uh, uh, reputation in particular, uh, it's really helping us a lot because uh, we can talk to, to the people through the media, through you, and explain the merit of uh, insect uh, and explain what is coming for them uh, and what needs to, uh, to happen. So it's, it's very important to, uh, to have that, that forum uh, to, to communicate and change mindsets. And Heba? Yeah. Uh, winning this prize, it will be a great opportunity for us to increase our impact, uh, footprint, as well as our reach. So we are thinking uh, to uh, scale up, up our project in different contexts by adding more features and functions for our product, uh, taking in consideration all the humanitarian aspects, as well as to uh, impact more beneficiaries, uh, even refugees or people living in remote areas, by implementing our energy and efficient solutions in this area. And Mahom? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I am, uh, we have a plan like others uh, that to scale up our uh, innovative uh, solution in the other areas. Because in the coastal area in Bangladesh is long, long area, 700 kilometers long. So uh, we are working only two districts and three sub districts. So we have to expand our uh, activities to other areas because people need support. And also, uh, we will focus the sustainability of our initiatives and we will develop some social entrepreneur in the society so, so that they can make available the, that kind of low-cost technology for removing the water crisis in the coastal area. And uh, I think uh, um, this is our challenge and I think by developing social enterprise and scaling up our project, we can double up our impact um, to the community. Very exciting. And um, finally, I'd, I'd like to ask this question actually to, to all of you. If you had to describe the future of sustainability in, in one word, and we can start with you, Mahon, what would that word be? Actually, uh, in the sustainability, uh, we think uh, we have to focus that the technologies can run long, long time. And um, as I mentioned that we all, we, we are installing now um, reverse osmosis technology. It is super technology. It needs a lot of uh, uh, lot of electricity, and uh, as we we are win we are winning this money, so we will install some solar systems instead of the grid line of that water technology. I think that can ensure the sustainability of that kind of water points, and also uh, we have some ponds and filters, so we will. Um, We'll, uh, we'll run some motors, uh, pump motors by electricity. So we'll install the solar instead of the electricity. And also the uh, important thing is we will do all the things involving of our local community that can ensure the sustainability of, the, of our initiative. So your word will be solar. Yeah, instead of the electricity, we'll go for solar, renewable energy. Perfect. Thank you. And how about? Yes, let me describe it in one word, equity. Uh, so everyone have the right to have an access for all the essentials need. No one should be left behind. So uh, I do believe this is, our, this is the future, yeah. Yeah, sustainability is often seen like a huge mountain to climb, a big challenge and some expect, expect a little bit scary. But I think if we look at the positive aspect, uh, in one word, I would say this is huge opportunity. Sustainability challenge is a huge opportunity. And Dr. Ricardo, final word. Solidarity. Do you want to expand on that? You, you have to think about the others all the time. 
You cannot think only of yourself. You have to think about others. Wherever you are, how you want to be treated. Which, which really informs how you interact with the indigenous uh, communities you say in, in that, your work yeah, as well. Exactly. Is, you know, treat someone like you want to be treated. Be solidarity. Solidarity is not altruism. It's a need for survival. If you're not, if you don't have solidarity, it's very hard. Life is going to be very hard. You have to look at the one beside you and treat them well. Excellent. And I, I think that's ultimately what sustainability is about as well. It's making the most out of the resources that, that we have and uh, securing those for future generations uh, as well. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for coming here today to, to talk about the important work that you're doing, but also how, you know, how you plan to scale up and what you're going to do going forward after, uh, you know, the recognition that you've received, uh, which is obviously very well deserved um, i'd also like to thank the audience it's been great having you here with us and uh, this has obviously been a live stream but the entire session will also be posted to the zayed sustainability prices youtube uh, channel uh, later today so thank you very much and uh, yes best of luck for the future cheers <laughs>